We appreciate each and every one of you for being here with us tonight. And to be honest with you, I feel something a bit of strange because I feel good. And I don't know about if I can do this, but I know that I'm leaning on God right now. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you wish, to the book of 2 Kings in the 4th chapter. And I don't know if I'm going to read all of this or just go with what I feel in my heart. But there's something I want to bring out of this to help us go forth into our future. To have a better understanding of what it truly means to walk in greatness. Now God put this scripture in my spirit and... I listened to two or three different sermons this morning and heard a lot of different pre people preach this a lot of different ways. And I'm not a cookie cutter preacher and I don't do things like everybody else does. I can only do it the way that God leads me. And I know that when I began to read this, how it inspired me. Because let me give you this word before I begin. God has called you to greatness. Somebody say that with me tonight. God has called you to greatness. Not just to have a fair life. Not just to get by. Not just to settle for where you're at. But greatness. Somebody say greatness. He has called you to not only have a life. Not only to have a good life. He said but to have life in it more abundantly. And I can't begin to express to you when I look at all the wonderful people that God has placed in my life over the years, how thankful I am for each and every individual that even if they weren't my own mother, that they were like a mother to me. And I can't even begin to be thankful for all the things that people have done in my life. I can't even express to you how grateful I am for loving and praying and faithful mothers. So if you all join me for just a moment, I want to give a hand clap of honor to our mothers here in this place tonight. I tell you, it's not easy being a mother. Can I get an amen from a sister in the house? It's not easy being a mother. And I tell you, it wasn't easy being my mother. But bless God, I'm here today. Some way, somehow. Which has to speak to at least some of her character of how she's still sane today. You see, God puts people in our lives to lead us to greatness. Now I want to read a little bit of this scripture. And I want to show you some of the qualities that God has put inside of you, say, in me, put inside of you that you already have that can take you on to greatness. Are you ready? Let's go ahead. 2 Kings chapter 4 at verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was, read that with me, a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set up for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. Now I begin to read about this scripture a little bit. And you find that Elisha must have passed through Shunem enough to where they had gotten to know him. And they had at least a relationship with him to the point that they were acquaintances. And when you read that where it says and he, she constrained him to eat bread... It was basically saying she was politely inviting him to come and eat at their table. Now, I don't know if you've given me an invitation to ever eat at your table, but if you did, you can bet I'd try my best to get there. 
Because I don't hardly turn down food. But in this passage, you find people that were of no relation. But you find the entrance of compassion. And as many times as he had come by, something began to quicken in her. What I like to call motherly quality is of compassion. And she said, I perceive that we need to do something. I perceive that we need to do something. Going to her husband, trying to get his attention, saying, I hope that you'll help me to build up a wall. And let's make room for this man of God. And let's not only give him a bed, but let's make him a table. Not only a table, but let's give him a candlestick too. That whenever he would come by, that he would have a place in my house. Aren't you glad that when God comes by, that as we make room for him in our life, that there's room enough for him to come into our temple and to make dining with us. It compels me to want to do something. The beginning of change is the want to do something. How many, you ever, how many of you have ever been to the point where you knew you wanted to do something? Show of hands, just a little bit of honesty. Not a lot of honesty, we don't want to get real. Just a little honesty. I have reached that point so many times, Doris, where I want to do something, but I didn't go and tell somebody to help me, right? So this is what I've come to do tonight. There are people that God is going to send our way. And I'm asking you tonight, will you help me build on a room? Will you help me build up a table? Will you help me put up a candlestick that whenever they would come, they would feel welcome? Do you know what I'm really asking you tonight? When we perceive that there are people that need a place, will we open up our hearts to let them feel like they're at home? Will we love them where they feel like that we're family? Let me tell you something. She wasn't a great woman just because of where she lived. She wasn't a great woman just because of who she knew. She wasn't great just because of what she possessed. She was great because of the godly qualities that were represented by her actions that took place. So there's something about saying that you're a great person. If you're a great person, you're going to have compassion. Let's put that in another way. We're going to have love towards others greater than ourself. We're going to have love greater towards one another than ourself. Can I be real with you? I love you more than me. I love you more than me. I care about you enough to see what's going in your tomorrow. I love you enough to call out your name. I love you more than me. My heart is filled with being concerned about you. You see, God put it in my spirit a long time ago that the more I sought for me, the less I sought for Him. And until I learn to seek for Him, I truly learned that to seek for Him is to seek for your needs above mine. Not just to call out to God in prayer only, but to be concerned about the needs that are right in front of me. Do you not perceive in these darkened days how many people beside you need God to shine in their life? Do we not perceive that even now in this very moment there are people sitting in this room now that need a move of God? Do we not perceive that even as we sit here biding our time that there are people that need help? I'm going to tell you tonight, I see you out here. 
I see because God lets me. Yes. And he knows exactly what you need. And I'm willing to stop the entire service and quit preaching right now if it help you find what you need. I'd quit preaching the rest of my life if it could cause somebody's life to be changed for the better. You see, if you're not looking, if you're not looking, then you are oblivious to the reality that's going on around us. There's a world where cell phones and technology are stealing away our children. There is a world in front of us where the multimedia of the world is enticing our young people to look to other things for their satisfaction. Now I know you may have only come in for you and you're for and no more, but my eyes look at those children and begin to think, God, are we not going to build them a place where they can come and feel welcome? And I'm not talking about giving them a room for Sunday school. Somebody help me preach. I'm talking about having an opportunity, an opening, a place where they can have a chance to get to know God greater. I'm telling you, friends, I'm not here to continue and play church with people that know church. I'm wanting people to come to church to get to know the church who is Jesus inside of me. And you've got to understand that in order to lead people to greatness, you've got to do great things. Can I talk about great things for a second? Great things don't come cheap. Helping people is going to cost you something. Praying for people and going the extra mile is going to task you, tire you, aggravate you at times. We have to admit it. We can't leave it in the dirt and put it under the rug. Aggravated at times, vexed at times. Well, I just wish they could get it together instead of, Lord, help them in the name of Jesus. I've been there with you. I've prayed for situations like that. Sometimes I've even had to pray that over me. Lord, I wish I could just get this together. That's all right. You can clap for that. I need all the help I can get. But I examine in this passage, as the man of God came again, he found this room. I'm just going the way I feel it. And he wanted to extend an offer of generosity back towards them. And he was consulting with Gehazi as to what they could do. So they come and basically said, well, we can put in a good word for you. We'll try to hook you up with somebody that can maybe help you out of some situations. It's nice to know somebody on the police force if you get a ticket, right? So basically what they were offering is, we want to get you connected with somebody that knows somebody. But in an act of humbleness, she turns that offer down. Now here's the interesting thing about obedience. True obedience is not doing something and expecting anything in return. True obedience is doing it without expecting anything. Because true obedience in God will always be centered around selflessness. True obedience will always be centered around sacrifice. What we are willing to give up in order to do God's will. And sometimes, to do God's will, we're going to suffer a little while. We're going to press a little while. We're going to go through dry places together. But as we continue to make an opportunity present for those that need it, therein we understand the true purpose of God in our life. I'm just beginning to understand this for me, so can I just share what I'm learning? God's true purpose in me is not for me to just grow as an individual. God is showing me that His purpose in me is to learn how to grow together with my brothers and sisters. Amen? How can we get along and serve God together lest we agree Turns the offer down. So the man of God speaks out boldly. 
that she'll have a child. And within a year's time, she bears this child. You find that as this child grows up, she goes from being, how would you say, without child, barren, to becoming a mother. Now, mothers, I'm looking to you for this next amen. Gents, you can hold your peace for a second. When you become a mother, there is nothing else more important than your children. Two mothers in here agree. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. There is nothing more important than your children. You'll do anything for them. You'd give of yourself. You'd fight anybody. You'd argue with anybody. You'd give your last dime. You'd give them your house. You'd do whatever it took for their satisfaction. Now keep that in mind. I've got something good for you. So we find that a situation arises where the, the child becomes a little ill. And they say, well, send it to its mother. And as she has the child with her, it grows ill and passes away. That's tough. To give up your own child in your own arms. It's difficult. Some people say that it's lost their children. It's something you never get over. A grief that no one can understand. I don't even pretend to. And in this moment of distress, we find one of the most profound responses that we could ever find. When being addressed about how you're doing, we hear these words, it is well. It is well. How many of you right now are holding a situation that you feel like is out of your control? How many of you is out there tonight? Am I just preaching to me? Some of us tonight, you don't even have to be a mother or a female. Some of us are going through something right now where it feels like that we had no control over what has already transpired. But what I want to spark into your spirit tonight, that in order to walk in greatness, you have got to learn to speak in faith. And to speak in faith means that you speak the very opposite of what you feel. So even though you may be holding something that feels dead, the Lord wants to see greatness come out of you to be able to say that it is. Somebody give God praise in this place tonight. You might be standing in the storm, but somebody say it with me. It is well. Woo! I don't even know how I'm standing right now. My Lord. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you. Verse 23. And he said, Wherefore will thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath that she said. It shall be well. Compassion and confidence you find in this situation. Now the greatest thing about faith that I love is that when I use it, God never leaves me alone. You know what that means? The very moment I link up by faith, Lord, I know you can do this. Something begins, something begins to stir up in the depths of my belly, and a peace comes over me, and I'm no longer in worry about it the way that I once was. And I'm here to tell you tonight, it's time that we stop saying it's not going to happen. It's time that we stop saying it's never going to change. It's time we stop using the words of the enemy. And it's time to start standing by faith and being faithful and start declaring to the enemy that it shall be well. If everybody heard from you that it shall be well, they'd want to be around you a little bit more. If they came to a church where we were saying it is well, then they'd come in and believe that they were going to get through the storm. But let me tell you what we sound like when we 
praise Him half-heartedly. We give Him a little bit of we're not sure. We give Him a little bit of I don't know. We give Him a little bit of I can't do it. But God wants you to know that it can be well if you declare it by faith. This faith was enough to even cause the man of God's trip to be adjusted in midstream. Now, if I was on my way on a trip and somebody called me and the beach was going this way and your knee was going that way, it'd be pretty tough for me to turn the car around. But if something was burning in me enough for enough just cause to turn back, then I'd have to. So you find that human compassion in the man of God comes out out of the faith and confidence of a mother. Can I give you this next little bit? Parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, under the sound of my voice, if you have children, don't you dare think God cannot save them. Today is the day to start changing our thinking from it cannot be to it shall be well. Until you transform your thinking, you will never exercise faith. And if you never exercise faith, the things that you ask for, you will ask amiss. Because God will not answer things that are not in faith. Some of you might say, well, if she had just complained about the fact that she lost a child that God promised, He would have surely moved for her. But that's not how the story went. So there's a virtue in this, isn't there? You find a little bit of temperance and self-control in her speech. I might be going through something, but that still does not mean that it is not going to be good. And some people think, oh brother, you're being fake. Oh, you're just saving face. Oh, you're just trying to pretend that you never got any problems. But let me tell you something tonight. I got problems just like you got problems. But that doesn't mean that I'm doubting God. It means that I'm declaring it shall be well. You see, I can't begin to get this out of me. Transformation in your life begins by your speech. What you say is what changes the situation. And you don't have to be in a church house for God to hear you. And God hears you in the moments when you say, I don't think I can. And He literally will put water on top of the fire. Just puts it right out. There are things, and I'm just being honest. There are things that I'm still praying for. That I've been praying for for a long time. And there have been things that have challenged my faith. More than I could ever explain to you tonight. But as I'm here, I still believe that it shall be well. Even if I have to wait until it's their last breath, I believe God's going to save every single person that I claim. You hear me? Every single person that's under bondage, every single person that's addicted, I'm faithful to believe that in the appointed time that God is going to change their lives. My speech used to betray me once. And I'm not just talking about cussing and talking dirty and making dirty jokes. But what I'm talking about is being a Christian, but not positively communicating my faith. Every time we read of the passion, we think of the viciousness of the physical assault. But let me put it to you like this, okay? Every time you speak negatively over what the cross accomplished, you might as well have your hand on the whip. Let me tell you, my friend, your words do mean something. I don't think that it was meaningless when somebody said, Lazarus, come forth. I don't think it was meaningless when somebody said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. I don't find it to be any coincidence that when God gave the inspiration and people spoke it, that we found that miracles were in the midst of their words. 
Somebody help me preach tonight. It was in the midst of their words. Somebody say words. It's your words that change the situation. It's your everyday speech that causes you to walk in greatness. What you say is what other people hear. And what people hear is what they perceive out of you. For people that are ignorant to the Spirit, we cannot rely on them to understand spiritual things. So if there's someone that's lost, and we're complaining about our situation to the point they hear no faith, then how can we expect them to come to church with us next Sunday? Can I give you an example? They tell us a little bit about how bad their week has been. God's trying to give us the spiritual cue to say, you need to help pray for them, or you need to say something nice or compassion or something. Well, what do we do? Well, if you knew the week I had, you wouldn't even tell me your story. Let me tell you what happened to me this week. Not a bit of faith in any of it. Oh, they said something about me. Oh, but I held my peace and I was so justified. And oh, I, they, they couldn't have ever done anything against me because I could never be wrong. Oh, but by the way, come to church Sunday. We got a great skit going on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll see you there. All right? I'll see you there. If our speech betrays us, we will not witness to the world. And if our speech betrays us when we pray over people, we won't see anything move. My Lord, I feel this. And when you're in the world, your words are like a light. It's like turning the lights on for somebody that's been lost for years. You know, for a long time, I wavered in depression. But then I got around a support system that taught me to see things for what they were, right? Doctors said I would need Prozac the rest of my life. And I even remember at the time when I, I was probably 15, 16, just mixed up kid. At the time I was wavering the decision, well, do I want to do this and do I not want to do this? And even back then, even as a young man, I knew that something just didn't feel right. But you see, as a young man, I didn't have understanding yet. You see, I needed a place where if I passed by, I would have refuge. Yeah. Let me preach it to you like this. Picture that Shumanite's home as your temple. Ooh, this is getting good, ain't it? My Lord. Picture that house as your temple. And let me ask you, have you built on and made room for somebody else Oh, my Lord, have we made room for somebody else? Salvation, to have salvation is to find refuge. Whew. To be rescued. My Lord, I'm glad that I'm saved. How many of you are saved in here? I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad I found refuge. I'm glad that somebody built a room for me to come. Not just a church building. But a place inside of their heart that when they saw the need, said, come on. Somebody help me preach. Come on. There's room for you here. Come on. You don't have to take your own life. Come on. You don't have to do drugs forever. Come on. You can have a new beginning. Come on. You can praise the Lord and be glad for the good things in your life. When we serve God in spite of what we see in response from others. You know what you're doing? You're making room. Whew. Oh, I feel this all over me. When you serve God anyway, you're making room for somebody else. My God, I don't come to preach just because you like hearing me preach. I'm here tonight making room for somebody else because there are too many people that are in need. For us to come in here and pretend like we don't know what we're doing. Is that too hard for you? 
Let's go on down to this. And when she came to the men of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her off. And the man of God said, Leave her alone, for her soul is vexed. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take thy staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If you meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Think about that persistence. Are you desperate enough in prayer that when you grab a hold of something good in your spirit that you're not going to let go until you feel something different? I'm going to give a little bit of divinical words right here. Sometimes when I'm praying and I get a hold of seeing something in the spirit happening, I don't let go until I feel a breakthrough. Amen? When you're praying for something and you start feeling God leads you in a way, then you need to grab hold of that until your faith moves you to the point that you see it done. Because until you can see it done, you will not be encapsulated by positive thinking. Because it's one thing for me to just get down and say, Lord, help me to believe. But it's another thing to begin to say, Lord, help me to see it done. And then when you start seeing it happen, then get a hold of those theoretical feet and don't let go until you feel something in your spirit. Because sometimes it can't be whom we want it to be. It has to be the way that God wants it to be. Yeah. And if we are persistent, we'll see God's hand move in a multitude of things. So we find confidence we find compassion and we find persistence. All of these are things that you find in great people. You also find these in great mothers, great parents. And if we can be the kind of church that when people fall, that we wouldn't scold them every time, but help them to learn and understand and to grow, yeah. then that's leading people to greatness. I can't be at a church where they preach to me that I can never make it or do it good enough. I can't live under a doctrine or a religion that makes me feel like I'm never worthy to do anything. You've got to understand something. God made you worthy when He saved you. And His blood will never fail you. So she was persistent to the man of God to the point that it moved him. And when it moved him, it moved him towards the miracle that came to pass. So some of you have been seeking for this. Maybe some of you have not. And you're just getting to receive this in passing. But I'm going to give you what God put in me as a revelation. Are you ready? Here it is. As we remain faithful in our spirit. Positive in our speech. And persistent in what we claim by faith in prayer. God will move and send His miracle to the exact situation to restore anything that has ever been destroyed. My Lord, I feel this. Ever been destroyed by the enemy. He had already been dead for a while, but wait till the man of God got a hold of it and stretched out over him. And all of a sudden, he sneezed seven times and come right out of it. Don't tell me that God can't do it. He'll do it if you'll show the compassion. Speak the word and be faithful. Until you see it through. Oh man. People miss so much of praise and worship. Because they think praise and worship is what is leading them to a feeling. But the purpose of praise and worship is not to lead you to a feeling. It's to lead you to a more positive atmosphere. His presence will enlighten your thinking. To make you realize, oh, things aren't as bad as I thought they were. Maybe God can do this. There's a song that I love to hear my sister sing. I listen to her sometimes at the church. She sings that now. It's, it's never too late for you to start over. 
It's never too late to begin again. It's never too late for you to start over. Something like that. And I listen to that and I think, Lord, you're changing me just by what I hear. So let me put it to you like this. When we are a beacon of His presence, all of us are required to shine together. And friends, I'm just going to be real with you. You can get upset and talk to me about it later. I'm ready for you. But let me tell you this. We're not doing it good enough. Because you know why? We're trying to do it the way we want to. Trying to worship our way when it's convenient for us, when things are good for us, when things work out for us, when they sing my song, when they sing the, something that stirs me, when such and such gets up, I know that we're having church. Listen, you don't need to wait and wonder when you can have church because you should already have enough about you in your life that church is in you before you ever get into a building. Our speech is betraying us, my friends. I'm telling you, the conversations that are going on out here have more power and dominion over people than the prayers and faith that's going on in here because if we truly had the upper hand, we'd see things happening. I'm just glad enough that somebody loved me enough to make room for me. Because in this day, I don't know if I could be saved. I don't know if there's enough love in people anymore to hold on. I begin to wonder if we truly are here for the right intentions. You know, some people treat church as a place to gather socially. Some people look at it, look at it as a place where they can try to find somebody that, that's not in trouble all the time and find me somebody I can hook up with and get married to. But it ain't no match.com. And it's not no Facebook. This is a house of prayer. This is a place to be taken seriously. This is a church that belongs to the Most High. And our behavior and demeanor is betraying God's potential. Because if we walked in greatness, signs, wonders, and miracles would follow us everywhere that we go. I'm going to say this as I close. If you are going to strive for greatness, you must possess compassion. That means loving someone greater than you. Now God's already been preaching on prayer, fasting. He's already been teaching us about how we regain our life, how we have self-control, how we begin to pour, put our prayer life in front of other things. And I just go back to that question as the Lord put it in my spirit earlier today. How bad do we want it? I'm telling you. One day, I'm going to draw my last breath. One day, I'm going to be older. Hopefully wiser. I'm not sure. Maybe I won't be. I don't know. I may not be as effective. I may not sound as good. I may look twice as crazy then as I am now. But I'm telling you, while I'm on my way there, Brother Matt, I'm getting a hold of and not letting go of every single soul that God puts in my spirit. And if they can't get saved here, I'm going to see them saved somewhere. You hear me? If they can't get saved in another place, I'm going to see them saved somewhere. Because in my spirit, I'm claiming it. And if I'm claiming it, the Word of God promised that it should be mine. Let's walk in greatness. Let's believe that we're better than what we were yesterday. Let's claim that which is rightfully ours. Healing is yours. Sound mind is yours. Prosperity is yours. And above all those things, seeing people added to the kingdom of heaven is most certainly yours. But just remember as you read in this scripture... The blessing and the miracle that came to pass would have all never transpired had she not ever made room. 
And that's what I'm asking you to do. In the ongoing weeks, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, if you're teaching, if you're preaching, if you're prophesying, if you're dancing, if you're playing music, if you're singing, that's my challenge to you. Learn in whatever you do to make room for other people. Learn in whatever you say that it be positive and empowering for someone else's life. When you pray, stop thinking it's going to the wall and hitting the floor. Because if you're faithful, it means something. We've got to take back our life. I don't know about you, but I'm coming out of this year a different individual than I was when I started it. The Lord spoke to me in my spirit in mid-December and said, You're entering a year of transformation. And I want to be different going forward than I've ever been before. You see, I've had plenty of enough time all my life to go through the motions of church. You can consider me a bit of a rebel if you want to. I'm going to break the mold. I'm going to break the model. I'm going to do whatever it takes to see somebody saved. Will you? Will you come out of your comfort zone? Will you praise Him when it's hard? Will you make room for somebody else to the kingdom of God? I hope you do. There are people even tonight, I feel like God wants to move. And I'm going to give an altar call. It's uncharacteristic of me, but I'm going to do it tonight. I would ask if you can come and get us a song, if you will. And while they're coming up here, let me extend this opportunity to you. I tried to take my own life twice. I suffered 10 years drug bound. But all of it changed because of one opportunity. Just one. I was a bitter and hateful person. I could not stand the thought of people caring about me. But all that it took was one opportunity. My friends, as we are here tonight, God is giving you that opportunity. If you want to receive salvation, the scripture teaches us that all we have to do is believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and on the third day rose again from the grave, that out of it we could be saved. And if you know him, and you're in that struggle and you're holding that lad, if you will, and you can't see God's hand moving, I'm giving you an opportunity to grow your faith where you stop saying it can't happen and start saying it shall be well. It's time that we revolutionize our character and that all begins with what we say. It begins with what we do. Because if all that we ever do is only for ourselves, we've not made room for anybody. You can have the biggest church in town. You can have the greatest programs. But without compassion for salvation, what good are you? And you can have the most talented people, the greatest prophets, the most amazing evangelists, but without concern for someone else's life. What good does it do to have it? And we can come Sunday after Sunday and Friday after Friday to the point where it feels like the same old thing. Or we can come in knowing that if we'll make room, that there might be a chance for somebody. Friends, if you are not saved, and you do not believe, and your life ends in the near future, let me tell you, you're going to make hell your home, and there's nothing anybody can do to try to fix that for you. And I'm not that kind of preacher, and I don't preach like this often, but I've just got to be real with you right now. Had God not intervened in my life, and had I not yielded to the opportunity, I would be gone already, and I would be in hell already. And there would be no, no safe place, no place to quench my thirst. There would, no be, no, there would be no safe place in hell. There is no safe place. It's eternal torment and it's nothing anybody would ever desire or dream on themselves. 
But this I do know. Tonight you're giving yourself an opportunity just by being here. And God wants to transform your life. Will you take this opportunity? Go ahead and stand with us if you're able and you want. And while you stand there as they sing, I pray that you help me pray. That if there be anybody here that needs salvation or needs faith to continue and believe. Help us pray for that tonight.